Hi, Alexander. Hi, hello. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Very well. Great seeing you. Yeah, it's good to see you too. Are you at the chateau? Absolutely. Awesome. You could see some. I hope some vineyards behind me. Maybe just a little sneak peek in the back. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so before we get started, um, I just wanted to um, kind of give everyone an idea of, you know, these series. So we had originally started them um, kind of at the beginning of the pandemic as a way to connect with our suppliers and connect with our team and our customers. And um, it's really developed into uh, this great tool where we're able to educate our customers and our team about these wonderful properties, um, you know, some of the best winemakers in the world that we're able to connect with live and give everyone access, you know, to ask direct questions. So, um, you know, this is something that we're going to continue doing. I'm doing all of the uh, Bordeaux lives, um, and my coworker David Hunter is hosting all of all of the other lives that we do. So it's every Thursday at 1 p.m. Uh, make sure you guys tune in. So without further ado, um, let me introduce our guest today. So Alexander Van Beek is the director of Chateau du School and Chateau du Tert, uh, both classified growths in the Margot Appalachian and also Calle Rosa in uh, Tuscany. But today we're going to be speaking mostly about the two Bordeaux properties. So, Alexander, if you would maybe just start us off by introducing yourself and just uh, a brief introduction on the properties, and then I've got some other questions for you. Wonderful, Celine. So, thank you very much for all the, the participants uh, for giving me the opportunity to express ourselves. Uh, voilà, so, I'm, I'm Alexander, and I uh, started very, very close to the same day today but then um, a few vintages back, uh, going back to 95, uh, that is where personally my story started as a, 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 young wine, a young wine geek who wanted to do a vintage. And um, uh, there was a wonderful uh, person, Eric Obadajelkovna and his family, who I knew well, who started his story in 95 by uh, uh, getting involved in Gispoor. Uh, what was his first uh, endeavor, and later uh, in 97, going to, to Chateau du Tertre in a secondary phase. And uh, he gave me, he, he saw the passion or the, the interest what I had for this, this wonderful uh, uh, job and this wonderful activity what we have. And uh, he needed somebody to trust. And slowly, uh, I, I integrated the team with a lot of uh, questions as he did, and, uh, and slowly we, we built a wonderful story over the last 25 years, what is now being continued by his, uh, uh, by his children. And, but back up just a little bit, so you're, neither of you uh, originated from the Bordeaux area. No, I'm afraid not. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's as close as I can get. I'm, I'm, so I'm Dutch, married French, but my mother is English, father Dutch. So I tried to, to do my best, and that's why I married Veronique, who's a true Baudelaire, and who is running uh, Chateau Aubaï, uh, of course, or just uh, on the other side of the, of the city, in the Pesach region. Of course, uh, yes. Um, so, so what exactly, so you were in Holland, and you decided that you wanted to just do a harvest in Bordeaux. To do it. Absolutely, it's like a, a lot of youngsters. <laughs> a lot of youngsters, they, they, they call us and they try to do a harvest. And if you find aspiring people uh, with a lot of energy, uh, just want to do something, you should take them on because they they, uh, they like to last. Uh, and that's how the, our sto or my story started. I was supposed to stay for two weeks and I never left. <laughs> so it's important to live life and not to plan it. Yeah. No, I agree with that. So when you arrived there um, and um, the ownership changed hands, it sounds like there was quite a lot of work to be done. So what were some of the bigger challenges that you faced when you arrived at first uh, Chateau G School and then Duterte? What were some of the, the big challenges and how did you overcome those? 
Now, the, the, the big challenge is, and I think that is the big advantage of when you come from outside, is you do not sit on, uh, on, on current situations. You want to understand, you want to learn. And, uh, and that's exactly what we did. We started with a very uh, simple analysis. What, what's the situation? What can we do better? And how are we going to get there? And uh, we needed, uh, mostly at Ciscour, we needed to seriously reinvest uh, in the vineyards. And that is something what we have been doing after the, uh, uh, the last 25 years in, uh, in bringing uh, a, a balance back in this, this beautiful terroir which Ciscour has and uh, replanting uh, a lot. Uh, with the right uh, varietals and the right uh, uh, portugette will really bring uh, a true expression of this, this unique terroir. And uh, with that, of course, came numerous investments. Uh, what was wonderful is uh, the family Alberta really had one vision, is, uh, is trying to make the best possible wine. Uh, they didn't come here to... to, to uh, to, to get uh, a, a big return, every penny what was made was reinvested in the in the property, and that's how we we slowly started to to uh, to construct to, to build to buy some more wine uh, vineyards around us, what mm -hmm. originally uh, belonged to the property, and, uh, and two years after our story, uh, so in '97 when we started at um, at Chateau de Terre. Also, so a lot of things happened: the vineyards, the infrastructure, the team. Uh, but the, the essence of a great, uh, a great property is always in the vineyards. And when you're young, you, you sometimes try to do too much. You try to, to follow certain tendencies, in into uh, uh, try to to uh, to to, uh, to make something. Uh, with with a with a dynamic uh, technical approach, and then you always learn is that the last word is always the true terroir uh, and the, the, the in correlation what the vintage what what makes a great wine. Uh, you can put some makeup on it, but the true personality always comes out uh, through the through the terroir. Of course, definitely. So speaking of terroir. Uh, I'm just putting up right now, uh, it might be a little hard for some of you to see on your phones, but I've tried to zoom in a little bit. This is the appellation of Margot, so for those of you who are not as familiar with the layout of Bordeaux, Margot is the first of the major appellations that you hit when you come out of the city of Bordeaux on the left bank. Um, further up you have saint julien Pauillac, saint -Estep. Um So. Can you tell us, Margot is actually quite a large appellation compared to, let's say, saint Um yeah. And if you guys can see right at the bottom here, you have Chateau G School, which is a little bit uh, further east, and then pretty much due west, you have Chateau du Tertre. So they're in different parts of the appellation, still in the southern part of the Margot appellation, but can you tell us a little bit generally about Margot and the style as well? Margot, it's, it's, it's the appellation where you get the best of both worlds. <laughs> you, you, you are um, uh, just north, so the first communal appellation where you, you, you leave Bordeaux. And you still have uh, an appellation. It's to really understand is you have to go back to the essence of the terroir. And it's very easy to understand because when we have the city of Bordeaux, which you can see on the, uh, just south of the, on the chart, that's where on the left, I mean, on the, on the southern part of that, you have the appellation Grave. And there you have, of course, Grave means gravel. There you have the most of gravel. And it's there where at Aubryon, at Aubaye, Pape Clément, is where the harvest starts. Because big gravel retains the heat, gives a warmer environment. And that's why you always have this very this softness uh, related to the appellation Grave. Then you come into the northern part, to this peninsula, of, uh, of the Medoc, where on the right hand side you see the river, but far on the left hand side you see that you have the ocean. So this really creates a typical microclimate. And where we, we come into a, an, an terroir where the influence of the river really played enormously on this gravelly composition. 
And therefore, how more north you go, how more masculine the wines become, how more uh, harsh the tenants become. And our real job in, in Margot is really to always try to find this, this sensitivity, this precision, this delicacy, what, uh, uh, what makes the, the wines in Margot always a little bit more, uh, a little bit more Burgundian in a certain style. Uh, but keeping the, 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 the backbone of the true Medoc, uh, Medoc region. Okay. Voila. And then I just wanted to zoom in here. This is um, Chateau du Tep, yes. which, you know, oftentimes we don't talk about elevation in Bordeaux, but when you are at the highest point in an Appalachian, it's you have important. to mention it, <laughs> especially especially for a for a Dutchman. It's very important <laughs> to to have the notion of altitude because we live under the sea level most of the the, 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 the time. Uh, Dutertre really sits on the highest peak of the Appalachian, uh, Margot. And what's 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 passionate is that both states they touch each other. They're both in the same Appalachian. Uh, they're both classified growth. They, they, they own by the same wonderful uh, Albert Ayelkersma family. And yet again, the two uh, personalities are completely different. Yeah, tell us about the different styles between G School and Zeft. So it's, it's, it's very logical. You will see also in the positioning, G School is closer to the river, so therefore had more influence from the river on its soil. And, uh, and you find in the terroir of, of uh, G School a certain amount of, of clay. Clay gives a lot of structure to the wine. You get also an, an, an composition of sand and pebbles with this clay. What's because of, you can understand the movement, the force uh, of this river, give a more compact uh, ground. So the root structure has to fight more to penetrate the soil. And that's why you always get a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, um, uh, enormous amount of strength in the style of, of, uh, of this tour, as where when you go up a little bit more inland into the, the village of Aksa, when you come to Dutet, you sit on that highest point of the Appalachian, where we carry a little bit more sand in the equation. And this gives enormous amount of delicacy. What's interesting, this tour is one of the most masculine wines from the Appalachian, and Duterte is really one of the most uh, elegant, the one of the more most Margoish styled Appalachian uh, wine of the of the Appalachian. And uh, with that, what's very interesting also is Duterte carries an enormous, uh, fairly high amount of, of Cabernet Franc in the blend, and that always gives this very spicy freshness. What really stands out in the personality. As where well this tour, we always have, of course, the backbone of the Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, which gives enormous amount of tension and direction in the wine. Uh, so it are two completely uh, different personalities, of course, with both the, co the Margoish co -note. So it would be interesting to taste them side by side. So everyone, if you have two bottles of the same vintage, hopefully, of Dutertre and G-School to taste them side by side. If not, we have plenty of stock for you, so. Oh, and you Very <laughs> important, very important to get those bottles. <laughs> um, speaking about the styles and the different wines that you make at the estates, can you talk a little bit about the second wine? So these are Chateau G-School and Chateau Dutertre are both the Grand Vin. And then you have a second wine, and even, I, I don't know if you considered a third wine at G-School, but La Sirene at G-School, and Les Hauts at uh, Chateau du Tertre. Can you tell us a little bit uh, about how you make the selection? I mean, obviously, it's somewhat of a, of a recipe. You can't give all the secrets away, but how do you decide what uh, makes Grand Vin and what makes the second wine at each of the estates? And is it the same approach? You, mu you must never forget is that uh, a lot of times, especially in the U.S., some people think a second wine is the leftovers. A second wine of the approach what we have uh, is, is truly is trying to, to, uh, to work on, 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 on harmony, on, on, uh, on precision, and bringing different personalities together of having the expression of the different terroirs we have, with the different varietals, 
And depending on the, uh, the personality of the vintage, they give a different expression. And then to try to, to bring those together in a, harmonious, uh, in a harmonious way. So all our parcels are being treated to make the Grand Vin. Then when you have those individual, for instance, you take, uh, we have around, uh, you have around eight different uh, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon uh, batches where you will then work with as a basis for your, uh, uh, for your first and your second wine. And you will have maybe uh, four fantastic uh, uh, Cabernet um, uh, vets, but two of them, they will mismatch. And then it's so important that you do not force to bring those personalities together and to form an, a unified identity. It's then very important to use that is a base as for your second wine. And then, of course, when you have your second wine, the approach also in vinification is a little bit different. We really try to have the, the fruitness stand out a little bit more to give that accessibility. And then yet again, with a little bit of younger vines, who do not have the, uh, uh, the depth yet, yet of their older brothers uh, to, um, uh, to, 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 to build around that. So it's uh, uh, a second wine is always quicker approachable, so it's uh, uh, easier to drink. In the wallet, it's also a little bit cheaper, but it really, what's, what's interesting, it, it really shows uh, the, 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 the identity of the, 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 of the estate, but just maybe in a little less of a, of a dimension. Okay. Uh, and so, I'm... I must have asked this last time I was at the property, but where does the name Siren come from? So Siren means mermaid. Um, so why that it's, name? It's a, it's, a, it's a passionate story. Bordeaux has always been an, an enormous um, melting pot of different um, cultures, of different uh, people from all around the world. And it was actually related to an Irish family uh, who used to be owner here, and they were uh, merchants uh, and used to trade a lot, and they had a fleet. And in their coat of our, in their coat of arms, they had a mermaid in a crown. And when they were owner, they brought this uh, this mermaid to the property uh, to what became the, the the logo of it, and it really fits fantastic because. To have what is a more, more nice than a beautiful woman in a crown to be your uh, to be your token of um, uh, of of, uh, of identity. So it's uh, it works very well. That's why the second wine is called the Sirene de Discours, the Sirene of Discours, the Mermaid of Discours. Okay, that makes that makes a lot more sense. I don't have a picture of the bottle to put up here, but um, I can I can it's... I can show you. I can show you. <laughs> okay. Voilà. So you're gonna have to it, hold very it very easy. still. <laughs> you have the the sirene de Giscourt, What's the silver? Uh, sirene. Put it up just a little more. Voilà. There you, you go. It? Voilà. The sirene de Giscourt is the silver label, and then of course the the chateau Giscourt can only be the gold oh, of sirene in the in the crown. Voilà. That makes sense. <laughs> Thanks no, for showing it. Ma it makes sense, absolutely. Um, what um, are, do you guys have any major projects coming up, looking into the future? I mean, we do talk a good amount uh, about climate change and how that affects decisions being made now at the property, but is there anything else? Um, that you guys it's, have in the plans. <laughs> there, there are enormous, uh, enormous amount of, of, of plans in the pipeline, and uh, it's it's always, uh, especially at the moment now that we are again in the, in the, in the start of this new vintage, what well, is literally uh, starting in the, in the following days. Um, you haven't started, just started harvest yet, right? We we started our harvest yesterday with our rosé. So okay. it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's always great because the weather for the coming two weeks looks, looks fantastic. So oh, we're all very, great. very, uh, very happy. But there, as you say, it's you have to every year be able to, to define 
uh, new territories of dedication on how to work and to find more and more precision. That what really uh, is, is related to what Margot stands for is the sense of detail. And the sense of detail comes back in everything. You mentioned uh, changing climate. I give you an example is, is that we, we are now measuring the hypocal stress, what, what plays in the, in the leafage and what has a direct impact on the, the whole uh, maturity process of finding the, the, the absolute right maturity of your grapes. So what we do when you have a an, an hot uh, uh, period ahead of you, you try to just lower the canopy a little bit so that you have less evaporation of humidity what leaves the vine uh, through its leaves. So you capture more, um, uh, more activity to bring the maturity to the, to the fruit. Uh, but there are a lot of different uh, elements of what we've learned in the last, uh, in the last uh, 10, 15 years uh, on how we can adapt ourselves also by using different uh, uh, grafts, different, different varietals uh, on different soils to be much more in cohesion with the, uh, the, 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 the change in climate. And then, of course, you have with that, when you try to work more precise, you try to, uh, to, to have a, a better mosaic of all those different terroirs that we have, that uh, you have a vinification facility what's completely adapted to that. So to have smaller vats, uh, to have more uh, samples to choose from when you put your, your assemblage uh, together. And you can see that in the pictures what you're showing, this is at the depth uh, where we went enormously uh, uh, forward in the last couple of years, again, to just be spot on on every square meter nearly uh, of different terroir, where we can really uh, be uh, so precise in respecting all those different uh, uh, parcels all through the vinification until the, the end decision of the, of the blending. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's crazy. It's really just a big puzzle that you have to put together and uh, really have a vision for what the wine will taste like years and years later. Absolutely. It sounds it's, fun. <laughs> it is, it is. <laughs> so I think if anyone has any questions, feel free to put them in uh, the comment section. Um, and I have one last question for you, Alexander. So, well, it's a two-part question. Um, what is your favorite vintage of G School to drink right now? Is my first ah, that's question. A very, it's a very good question. Uh, it's like, what, what child do you prefer of all of your children? I know. Everyone says the same thing. You can just give me one or two that you enjoy. Some. <laughs> There's some outstanding vintages to be enjoying now. It's like the, the, the 2004, but also the 03. The 05 the, the deserves a decantation. But then again, you come to vintages like the, the 09, what's of course a, a splendid vintage to enjoy now. Uh, the 2012 is also a vintage, very fruit forward, has a lot of enjoyment at the moment. Uh, and then you come to, to some, some younger vintages, what's the 15, if you decant that uh, uh, an, an, a good hour before, you really have an, uh, you have an amazing uh, symphony in your glove. Definitely. But, uh, and but don't, forget, don't forget more delicate vintages, like the 99, uh, some people tend to forget. Uh, it's, it's so charmful. Uh, the, even if you come to vintages uh, like the 01, uh, also a little bit of those shadow vintages, we have such, so much energy and are really showing uh, great value and uh, have, have really an, uh, an amazing amount of, uh, uh, of value in your class. Alexander, I think you mentioned every vintage possible. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Um, no. I have uh, two, two questions that came in. Uh, first is, how's the 2020 vintage looking? You're about to start the harvest, so how's it looking? I, it's, I will tell you honestly, we, we finished last vintage in 2019, what was, I think, one of our most precise vintages we ever made. Sorry, hold on, uh, Alexander. I have someone who wants to say hello. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> 
Hold ah, on. Okay. <laughs> the man himself. <laughs> <laughs> Ça va bien, Dieu? Très bien. Very well. Very good. No, you guys can catch up later. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we can talk. Okay, we talk later. Hi. <laughs> Great, Dieu. <deal. laughs> no, it's... It's to, to come back to the 2020. So it's always very difficult to, uh, uh, after a great vintage, say people say, oh, the next vintage copy is good, of course. Don't forget, there's a lot of vintages. They, they travel in pairs, in trios. And we had a, we had a, um, a very warm month of, uh, of July. Uh, we had a very dry season of nearly, uh, nearly 60 uh, three days of not a drop of rain and uh, 10 days we go we had 40 millimeters of rain and after that we got sunshine so it's it's uh, we're just in the beginning stage of um, uh, of, of course working up building to the, the, the absolute right maturity before we start to harvest but we are we're we are pretty happy so far uh, there have been some challenges through the uh, through the cycle, but all of those have been uh, uh, been treated very very well. Uh, so it's uh, we have a, 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 a nice healthy crop waiting for us to uh, to to discover this this uh, this newest uh, vintage. Yeah. Fantastic! That's good to hear. Um, <laughs> and I just had uh, someone ask if you could just briefly talk about Calle Rosa. It's in, in Tuscany and it's the newest uh, purchase from the family. Just a few words about it. It's definitely a wine you, you have to uh, uh, discover. It's a unique property, but more or less what we created uh, not far from scratch. What a very, a more, I would say a little bit more contemporary uh, vision than, of course, the very a classical uh, classified grows what we have here. We use a multitude of different varietals uh, where we completely work uh, from the, the creation of this property biodynamically. Uh, it's a property what we planted in very high density. It was very uh, rare to this region. So when you have more density, you have more competition also between the vines and you have deeper root structure. So you also have more freshness uh, with the, the, the more freshness in the tendency, uh, also in combination of the, 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 the situation where our vineyards are on a higher altitude. It's a typical Tuscan wine, but it carries the, the delicacy, uh, which you could maybe find a little bit in our, our Margola properties, with an enormous amount of, uh, of freshness in the wine. But it's and, for us very important. Are they Bordeaux varietals, or what is the... Of course, we, we <laughs> of have... Course. Uh, we have our Bordeaux varietals, we have all four of them, but we also, of course, have Saint-Gervaise, we have some Syrah, and we have a little bit of, uh, of Mouvelle and, uh, and Grenache also with what we play. And okay. uh, so it's, 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 uh, it's you know that where the Medoc is kind of flat, of a little bit of, of, of uh, hilly, uh, Calle Rosa is like an amphitheater that looks out into the Mediterranean. Uh, of very different soils, different expositions to the to the sun uh, and to the the, 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 the microclimate. It's really a, a big challenge, but it's it's a lot a lot of fun uh, to uh, sure. to discover this region, what has an enormous potential also. And uh, someone's just asking where specifically in Tuscany. So it's in in a, it's just north of uh, of uh, of Bulgari in a small village called Riparbella, and we're situated on an altitude between uh, 300 going up to, to nearly 500 uh, meters above the, the, the Mediterranean. So you, you really have a, 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 a stunning view of, uh, of, of, of Corsica Elba in the Mediterranean. And then yet again, you see the road that goes from the coast to San Gimidiano, Volterra, into the hearts of, uh, of the Tuscan backland. So it's uh, definitely worthwhile in uh, a region to come and uh, to a property to come to, to visit. All of our properties are all open yes. nearly all the year. And we love to exchange uh, passionate moments with, uh, uh, with people who take the effort to come and, uh, to come and visit us. 
Definitely. I've been to, I've been lucky enough to be, to have visited Chateau du Terre and Viscourt. And uh, once we can travel again, uh, I highly recommend taking a visit over there. Uh, one last question. It's the second part of my two part question is when you're not drinking, and someone actually asked, when you're not drinking Chateau Viscourt or Obaï at home, what are you drinking? Great champagne. <laughs> no, we, I, I'm very curious, and uh, uh, I, um, uh, of course, but my my wife is also uh, heavily into into wine, so we love to discover uh, a lot of regions all around the world. Um, also, of course, a lot of Californian regions we like a lot. Uh, Burgundy is is very close to uh, to our hearts. Um, again, also, it's, it's, it's the sense of precision, uh, what we also have uh, and like to carry in our uh, philosophy of, of uh, on assembling a wine. Uh, so, of course, Pinot Noir, it's all about this, this sense of detail, this precisional expression. Uh, we do this with four varietals here in Bordeaux, and, uh, and it makes it uh, uh, a lot of fun, a lot of hard work, but... Uh, um, at the end, you, you, you also get the, uh, the, the, the great refinement and, 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 uh, and return on that. Of course. Well, I think that just about wraps it up for us um, on the timing, but I just wanted to thank you very much, Alexander, for taking the time. I know this is becoming a very busy time in Bordeaux with the harvest, so I really appreciate you taking a moment to chat with us, chat with our team, our customers, uh, and everyone who could tune in today. Um, and we wish you the best of luck with the 2020 vintage. And uh, hopefully, well, hopefully we can see you on this side of the pond sometime soon. For sure. And thank you very much, Nim, for, for setting this up. And uh, I wish you all good luck because your job is not easy in those more complicated times also. We all have to rediscover ourselves, rediscover our jobs, our, uh, our, our old-fashioned movements. And it's, it's, it's great to have a, a glass of wine to find that inspiration and to find the new, uh, uh, new way of uh, our new cycle, what is waiting for you. So thank you very much. And to all of our, 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 your viewers and your clients, you're always welcome here. I would love to build a bridge to come and get you. Uh, <laughs> but if you make it, you're always delighted to, to, uh, to spend a good moment with you around the great glass of wine. So thank you. We'll definitely take you up on that. Thank you so much, Alexander. Talk thank you, you very much, Lynn. Give my love to, uh, to Guillaume. <laughs> I will. <laughs> Bye. Ciao, ciao. Bye.